You are about to witness history in the making. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another Pop Culture Gamers podcast. This is show number 110. It's the 20th of March. My name's Hayden, and I'm here on my own. Unfortunately, Steve's still not well, um, and so unable to join us. He needs to take things easy uh, at the moment, uh, but hopefully he'll be back real soon with us, because we're certainly missing him, um, and I'm missing him being on the show. Um, So, in terms of what's been happening I've got to be honest, things are, um, how can I put it, blurring one week into the other at the moment. My mother-in-law is still very poorly um, and in hospital. We've had a day waiting by the phone to see if she's going to be moved hospitals uh, from where she is. So it's just been one of those sort of uh, weeks really where I haven't really been able to progress because of a lot of things on our minds. But, um, well, hopefully we'll get there soon. I did get a couple of uh, nice things I got um, from Eagle Moss. Uh, the first one was a XL version of the USS Voyager to add to my Starships collection. And then the other one was of the Starbase that's around Earth that you see in, uh, for example, Star Trek The Search of Spock, those sort of movies. Um, to, you know, the really large sort of like, um, on well, like elongated saucer, uh, sort of design. So I've got both of those, and they look absolutely fantastic. I'm going to need to start to really organise where I'm going to get this collection going now because, well, I've got quite a lot of them to be quite honest with you. So other than that, not really an awful lot that's been happening to me. Um, been in a bit of a gaming funk at the moment. Really been trying to find a game, a game to sort of engage my brain with but just really not um, getting there very fast with it anyway let's move on to gaming this week no longer a dream but a reality all right so gaming this week and we've got a bit of news actually which is good news for playstation uh, owners You'll be able to download free indie games and PSVR games starting from March 25th. Um, And get ready for this because it's a PS4 uh, blockbuster sort of lineup at the end. Because Horizon Zero Dawn, the ultimate edition or complete edition, whatever it is that they call it, will be free um, to download for a month as well. So starting from March the 25th, I believe it is, there will be Enter the Gungeon. An Abzu with Res Infinite, Subnautica, The Witness, Astro Bot Rescue Mission, Moss, Thumper and Paper Beast. They'll all be available from March. And then on the 19th of April will be Horizon Zero Dawn Complete Edition. That'll be free to download from the 19th of April to the 15th of May. New releases for the week. We have on the P- oh, oh, sorry, from the 23rd, we have Overclocked, All You Can Eat on a PC, PS4, Xbox One and Switch. And Story of Seasons, Pioneers of Olive Town on the Switch. From the 25th, we have Black Legend on PC, PS4, Xbox, uh, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X and Switch. Evil Inside on the PS4 and the PS5. And then from the 26th, we have Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 on PS5 and Xbox Series X. Terminator Resistance Enhanced on the PS5, It Takes Two on the PS, uh, PS4, Xbox One and PC, Balana World, uh, sorry, Balana Wonderworld on PC and Switch, and Monster Hunter Rise on the Switch. In terms of subscription games, um, we've got coming soon to Game Pass is uh, Genesis Noir, Deadfire, uh, Super Hands, Octopath Traveller, Yakuza 6 and uh, Narita Boy. So all of those are uh, coming in this month. For Epic, 
There is The Fall currently available and that will be available until March 25th. And then after March the 25th to the um, 1st of April, we'll have Creature in the Well. So some good games there. I'm really looking forward to uh, dipping back into The Fall because I never actually completed that game. And I know that it's not really a difficult um, one, but it was quite a good story from what I remember of it. What I would always say to you guys as well, even if you don't really play PC games, in terms of Epic, it's well worth just logging on, getting the free games, and then if and when you one day do get a PC um, that you're going to use for gaming rather than, you know, like your laptop that you might have at the moment or whatever, or even if you just do it on an iPad, then at least you've got a collection of games ready to go. They might not be the latest and greatest, but they do do some really good blockbuster games in there. Um, anyway, some, well, that's it really, because I haven't been playing very much games, um, at all, uh, to be honest. I've actually, I've been so incredibly bored with, uh, gaming at the moment that, um, I've actually started to, well, play some really rubbish games that are on the PC, like Doodle God Blitz HD and things like that, just because I can't get into gaming. And I I think it's probably because of all of the distractions that are presently um, ongoing. I'm saying I can't get into gaming, but yet, you know, even though that I say that, that has still not really uh, stopped me from collecting the gamer score. I'm still um, on there. Um, and this month I've collected 8,860 gamer score. Uh, so I've obviously been playing, uh, some stuff, but to be honest, a lot of it has been pretty much indie rubbish. Um, nothing really worth, um, mentioning about, uh, on there. Um, have been playing Grim Fandango Remastered. I've been quite enjoying that one. I did try that Snakey Bus, um, which is an interesting one on, um, I think it's Game Pass that that uh, turned up on. And basically you pick up people and uh, drop them off at um, designated points and your bus grows longer and longer. So it ends up being um, a bit like the old game of um, Worm or Laser Cycles, whatever it is that you want to call it from back in the old 8-bit days but it's on a three-dimensional thing where you're driving a bus very weird sort of game been playing bullet beat that's actually not a bad sort of um if you want you know what i mean a relaxing shooter um if you can have such a thing um been playing a bit of elder scrolls uh skyrim so you guys know how, and also Fallout 4, you guys know how much I hate that, so, and I've been playing that, that's how bad it's been, uh, been getting, because I've just not been able to engage a game, um, that's really caught my attention, the last one that I did was Control, um, which I recently completed anyway, and I did start that on another platform, but to be honest, once I got to the end of it, I didn't really want to go, carry on going through it again, so, um, but I would recommend Control if anybody's uh, been looking at that and fancying it. It is, I think, on Game Pass at the moment. Really, really well worth um, having a go uh, at that game, uh, definitely. So, yeah, I would recommend that one. All right, so really, really short bit for uh, gaming this week, but we'll go on to movies, TV and streaming. In quest of a better life. So, movies, TV and streaming, and we have some news. So, Resident Evil movie uh, reboot has been officially, uh, or the title of it has been officially revealed. So, director Johan Roberts revealed that uh, new details about the movie, which is um, a reboot of the franchise, which will combine the stories of the first two Resident Evil games. The movie maker himself has revealed that the video game adaptation is going to be titled Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City and it will be um, adapting the first two video games in the series meaning that we'll be seeing both the Spencer Mansion and Raccoon City itself. Um, Johan's uh, dropped the information in an interview during this year's edition of uh, SXSW um, as we've 
uh, you know, previously revealed this new adaptation of the uh, Capcom game um, series is set to be in 1998. So, um, but it's not going to be linked to the previous um, movies um, with Mila um, in there either. So it's going to be complete reboot. I'm kind of like glad about that because those movies, the previous ones, while they were entertaining, they didn't really feel like Resident Evil to me in a lot of ways other than some of the sim- the familiar characters. Another bit of news is about Ace Ventura 3, and evidently that is planned at Amazon for a th- theatrical release. So hot off the heels of Coming to America 2, we now have Ace Ventura 3. So after more than 25 years, it seems that Ace Ventura is poised to make a comeback to the big screen. It's been revealed by Morgan Creek, one of the studios behind the original Jim Carrey comedy, that Ace Ventura 3 is in active development. What's more, the writers behind Sonic the Hedgehog are involved, which does kind of make sense when you think that, um, obviously, Jim Carrey took the role of um, Dr. Robotnik on the Sonic movies, so there is a link, uh, you know, to him from that movie as well. But the details are currently scarce on the project, um, so we don't really know what's uh, going on. But what we do know is that evidently it's not been specified whether or not Jim Carrey is going to return to the role. How we can have a movie if he doesn't return to the role, I really can't see it um, myself. But, you know, evidently it's one of those things. But during the interview um, with the representative from Morgan Creek, the interview discussed the studio's history and expansive library in the future because the company's also seen a demand to revive many of its properties, including The Exorcist, which had previously been um, revealed as a movie that's on its way. So... Looks like we're going to be seeing a lot more of these remakes of movies that, um, well, we thought were done and dusted and we're quite happy with that, to be fair. So let's see how that uh, pans out. In terms of Blu-ray and DVD releases, there are some quite good ones this week, actually. We've got the 4K Blu-ray of Batman. That's the uh, Titans of Cult Steelbook. There is Dawn of the Dead 4K Blu-ray. Gattaca 4K Blu-ray. Now, I watched that again recently. I haven't watched that for many years. But I really, really do love that movie. I know that it's not the most exciting movie. It's more of a sort of whodunit um, kind of movie rather than science fiction or anything like that. But I, I, it is one of those movies that, for some reason, I really, really like and I can't quite put my finger on it. Well worth a look, guys, if any of you want to watch it. I think it's running on Sky at the moment, which is where I caught it. So it'll be on that Sky movie sort of cycle at the moment. The next one is It Came From Beneath The Sea, a real uh, old masterpiece there. Uh, Jojo Rabbit, uh, 4K Blu-ray. Journey to the Far Side of the Sun on Blu-ray and DVD as well. And then we have the Wonder Woman 1984 with the Amazon exclusive 4K Blu-ray Steelbook or the Wonder Woman 1984 Blu-ray 4K, Blu-ray and DVD or the Wonder Woman 1984 um, normal Blu-ray uh, as well. So there's lots of different versions of that movie for you to be able to get to. Obviously, we all know that the 4K Blu-ray is going to look absolutely fantastic of that movie, even though it was the best version of um, a Wonder Woman movie. Blu-ray and DVD charts, we have at number five, up from six is uh, Tenet. At number four, down from three is Harry Potter, The Complete Collection. At number three, new entry is THX 1138. At number two, up from 11, is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And at number one, straight new entry in, is Doctor Who, The Collection, Season 8. So, I have been watching loads of stuff, actually, because um, I seem to have been more concentrating on TV this week than I have on uh, gaming. And uh, the first one I want to shout out about is Resident Alien. Um, this is on Sky One at the moment and really, really enjoying this show. It is really good. Um, it's uh, about an alien who crash lands on Earth when he's come to destroy the residents. 
Um, because of the powers that he's got, he's able to take human forms. He kills the guy, takes his form, throws his body in the river, sort of thing. And uh, then somehow gets conscripted into being the um, local town's physician or doctor, whatever you want to call him, um, for um, a set period of time because the town's sort of like isolated and it needs a town doctor until they can recruit somebody else. So it's really, really interesting uh, sort of show. Um, and all of the time he's going about climbing mountains or, you know, going in the wilderness trying to find this machine to destroy all of humanity. But it's as he's also coming to terms with all of these new strange human emotions that he's experiencing now that he's replicated the genetic form of a human. So it's a, a good show, really strong um, sort of like acting cast in there. Very good. Well worth a watch. would highly recommend it. The next one. So we've had one division. Now we have the Falcon and the Winter Sh- Sh- uh, Sh- Soldier. So the new show has hit hard um, with the action right from the start. And it starts out with absolute loads of action for Falcon. While this is going to be an action series, obviously because of the nature of these two characters, this is actually a lot more of a thought-provoking sort of view of superheroes. Um, it's really is uh, good to, that they're showing um, this interesting aspect of the characters with their personal lives. So with uh, Sam, aka Falcon, um, he's fighting with his uh, split priorities of he's looked after the world. But he left, you know, he had to um, drop by his uh, duties towards his family. Um, and now he's trying to recoup that with his family and his family's um, heritage is sort of like, you know, with the, the, the businesses um, going down the Swanee and looking like his sister's going to have to sell it, all of that sort of thing. And it's him trying to uh, save that. While on the other hand, you've got Bucky. Uh, aka the Winter Soldier, who is trying to make amends. He's been pardoned for all of his past sins as a Winter Soldier. And basically, he's a man out of time of by about 90 years. Um, and, but he's trying to make up for the wrongs that he's done. And, uh, you know, there's been quite a lot of um, development in the first episode for both of these characters about how they're making amends so for example Bucky has befriended an old man who was uh, the father of somebody who was killed who was killed by the Winter Soldier Uh, so that seems to be how he seems to be torturing himself in terms of making amends but really very good uh, so far and then there is the big shock reveal at the end of this because Sam um, hands back the um, cap shield, uh, you know, back to the Smithsonian to go with uh, their exhibition that they have there. And, well, let's put it this way, watch the show. Really, really well worth watching. It. I I was quite sceptical about this. I thought after one division, you, you can't, you know, lightning doesn't strike twice. It it might not have struck in the same way, but it's certainly there's an electrical charge there. I am really looking forward to episode two and seeing what that has in store and where that takes this show. Because there's not many episodes. I'm looking forward to seeing really this and the action sequences. All I can say is that that opening action sequence with Falcon, it you, that could have been in a movie. It was complete movie quality no doubt about it really super well worth watching guys absolutely okay and now the last one which is my views on the justice league the snyder cut probably quite good that uh, steve isn't here because i am quite sure steve will disagree with almost every word that i say uh, in relation to this so let's face it the original Justice League was um, not a good movie, shall we say. Um, for a lot of reasons, obviously there was 
the problems in the development um, leading to Joss Weldon directing the movie, blah, 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 um, or finishing off the movie, and so not having Zack Snyder's original sort of um, view of this, which has eventually led to the Snyder cut. Now, I don't think that this is going to be a modern trend now, because let's face it, there's not that many movies that will swap directors in such a way. But I just can't see it. It's a really, really expensive concept. Now, this movie rocks in at four hours. Really, four hours. It is a very, very long movie. Does it improve on Justice League? Yes, it does. Wholeheartedly, it massively improves on that movie. However, I'm going to use the figure of speech about polishing a turd and if you ever watch Mythbusters and you saw the episode where they polished a turd they proved that you can polish a turd but what they were left with was a polished turd and to be fair that's not much further on than what we are left with in terms of the Snyder Cut. I'm not saying it is really super bad it's enjoyable it has been broken up into several sort of chapters there you know it comes up you know when it when the end of one section is and gives you the title of the next section as if it was episodic so you could split it up into episodes and release it over you know like six episodes something like that which would be fine um but as if if, if you want to watch this movie all in one go well good luck because um i don't think even my bladder could like get me through four hours without having to get up halfway through the movie somewhere um it is tremendously long i'm gonna say personally i feel that the movie is way too gloomy the color palette that they have in the movie is not good it's very sort of dark dismal sort of coloring my biggest absolute biggest complaint about this movie is this is I think Zack Snyder watched the prequels of the Star Wars movies and saw that George Lucas did every environment as CGI and then decided that he would do that on steroids in this movie because there's very, very few real environments with possibly the exception of Bruce uh, Wayne's um, residence. Um, and a, you know, a couple of sort of warehouse shots. Other than that, everything seems to be CGI, uh, environments in totality. And there is, there is loads of CGI effects, which you would expect that in terms of a superhero movie. But when you actually look at something, um, you know, nowadays there's more of a move towards practical effects. This did not hit that mark at all. And to be honest, while it's good CGI, it's still CGI and you can still see it CGI. So in terms of that, I'm not a big fan um, of it in that respect. The next big thing for me was the music score. Some of the music score was really, really good. But then occasionally you did get the odd, really, really, really weird piece of music put in at the most inappropriate times that just did not fit what they were trying to do. Um, like, for example, uh, there is one bit where um, Aquaman is walking into the um, into the water, all these waves are splashing over uh, this like stone pier that has been built, you know, at this thing. He walks into these big crashing waves and there's a slow tune going on. And he just picked the wrong music. You know, he he, he went for something that was a li- along the lines of Perfect Day, that, that um, track, if you've ever heard that. But it didn't hit the mark and it would have actually been better to have gone with that that piece of music uh then in terms of what he went with it just it didn't fit it just it it off paced the movie and this is another problem with the movie as well the pacing is all over the place it's like a roller coaster in terms of uh, pacing you also have 
the well-known Zack Snyder slow motion sequences. It was either that or else I was getting so bored during the movie, but I think it was actually slow motion sequences. There's loads of them. There's loads of them. Absolutely loads. Um, way too many. I, I was okay, I was okay for the first 30, but when we got to 31 of them, I was starting to think, okay, I've seen enough of these. Um, Steppenwolf, awful design. I really didn't do not like, I didn't like the way that that character looked in the original Justice League. Somehow he looks worse in this one, although the special effects for the suit are very nice. Um, but I just, it was really awful. Another problem with the movie is it's still got Jesse Eisenberg as uh, Lex Luthor and he still thinks that he's playing the Joker for some unknown reason in this movie. He's awful as he normally is in movies. Don't like him at all. Um, really wish I would get rid of him on off it. I also think that the stupid Batman visions, I would have much preferred Zack Snyder to have got rid of those ideas because there is no reason... Batman does not have um, the ability to have supernatural experiences. It's not something that's really built into the canon for him. He's, he's not clairvoyant. He's the world's greatest detective. He's got a super mind. Now, I know that some people will argue, well, actually, the super mind will have put all of this together and it's him predicting, but there is no evidence there for him to predict what he predicts. So it just it doesn't fit. Also, I think that he must have had J.J. Abrams over when um, he was making a movie because there's loads of lens flare as well. Um, for me, the movie really should have ended at 3 hours and 34 minutes um, when they did the lineup of the superheroes after the United and the won. It's a superhero movie. You're not gonna, I'm, it's not a spoiler that they're going to win in the end. Um, but it's, you know, then... It drags on for another half an hour, um, which is not, you know, not good. Well, another 26 minutes, I should say, of which eight minutes of that or seven minutes of that are a future look, which effectively is what the next movie is about and setting all of that up. Personally, what I think that he should have done for that last 26 minutes is have a couple of minute montage of what the characters got up to. Very quick montage. Then go halfway through the credits, a la Marvel, where their way of doing things. And then done a 30 second clip of the future. Um, again, maybe montaged sort of thing. Um, but that would just have really have set that scene and then done another montage or not another montage, another 30 second clip cutting it down again of what happens outside of Bruce's home at the very end of the movie that would have been the way he should have done that that would have taken that 26 minutes and knocked it down to six at the most because the the, the this film it the great thing is it fills out the backstory for Cyborg it fills out more of the backstory for Barry Allen they're really, really good positive points. But there is more fluff in this than there is in the fluff collector in my tumble dryer. It's just filled with it. Um, so I'm, you know, I just, no. And, uh, Jared Leto's, um, the Joker. I really liked him. Um, in uh what was it was it batman versus superman that he was in or, or was it the uh um whichever well in a, in both movies that he's been in um but i just did not like him in this or suicide squad that was it that was the other movie wasn't it but i didn't like him in this one and it's because they changed that character um and it's a much more weathered sort of uh joker so as i mentioned a pacing but also, the aspect ratio is 4 by 3 I mean, really, I know that you want to make an artistic statement, but come on, 1.85 to 1 if you're going to do it in a different ratio to than 16 by 9 please. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, it does, it works out as a movie perfectly, 
as a sequel to Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman. There it's a seamless sort of continuation of that story. But it is proof if you polish a turd, you still get you still have a turd, it's just polished at the end of it. I'm sorry. I did not like this movie at all. I'm sure when Steve comes back he can give you his glowing report and say how it's the best movie ever. But for me, no. Not not a movie I enjoyed it, um, that much. But I did enjoy it better than the last one. For me, I think that the problem with DC is DC make good, well mostly good, uh, superhero TV. Whereas up until, um, well, with the exception of um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and even then sometimes not always, and WandaVision and hopefully Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that the Marvel have made mostly bad TV. But DC make mostly bad movies, whereas Marvel make mostly good movies. Marvel love them or loathe them. They have hit on a good formula in terms of the movies of having several build-up movies starring one or two characters which build up to a big event like the Avengers or like Justice League. What, in terms of this, and this is going to sound like a bit like an oxymoron, but DC, what they've done is they've done a couple of origin stories, Man of Steel, Wonder Woman, Batman didn't really bother with they just lumped him straight in with superman and then they did the first justice league version the weldon cut and then they did um aquaman afterwards and now they're still planning on doing the flash and it just it doesn't work like that and plus the fact when now we're on 2021 the man of steel was released in was it 2013 it's eight years ago we should have been on man of steel 4 by now not man of steel 2 which still hasn't got a um a release date so it's just they they have no idea the problem is is that they're spacing out the movies far too far along so the characters or the actors who are playing the characters have changed over that time and they've aged and it shows at least with the Marvel movies, they looked relatively similar age, movie to movie. Not one to the end, but certainly, you know, um, from one movie to the other, they don't look like they changed that much. And that's because you were seeing them in a movie once or twice a year. DC, um, you know, they, they just didn't, didn't get that. And they have way, way, way too long a distance. And it's such an easy trap for, film producers to fall into because movies are massively expensive to make but the other um thing is even marvel have fallen into that because when you look now you're going it's going to have been about uh well it'll be six years between doctor strange one and two um now doctor strange has appeared in two movies in that time um those being you know the two avengers movies but even so, that's, that is really a long time in terms of Marvel for the pace that they were going. And yes, we know that COVID has slowed that pace down and, you know, it's had a massive impact on the industry. But, you know, I'm, um, I'm just pointing out it's such an easy thing, um, to, you know, for the movie producers to think this is, this is the way we've always made movies. We make a movie. Then we wait a few years, then we make the sequel. For these type of superhero movies, if they're wanting to take on the Marvel formula, DC need to really step up the game here because they're not in competition with Marvel in terms of the way that they have gone. Granted, we've had a bit of a hiatus with um, Marvel at the moment, but they're coming back strong. They're going to come back strong very soon. So, you know, um, that's my views on it. I know that a lot of you guys will absolutely hate what I've said um, about it and that you'll have enjoyed it. And you know what? I'm really glad that you did. I personally, I thought it was better than the last movie. It's turned the movie from a three to a six and a half for me. But it's still not a great movie. All of the flaws that were there are more or less still there. 
What is good, though, is they've taken out all of those stupid comedy movements, like, for example, when the Flash ends up on top of um, Wonder Woman in that, you know, very um, awkward um, th- uh, moment. They've taken out all of those sort of comedy moments, but I think what DC need to do is really look at the scores, really consider the, all of the CGI environments that they're doing, and actually just making more engaging stories because it, Justice League, I was so wanting it to work. I grew up on Superman. You know, um, I've, I wa- I've watched DC all my life when it's been on. Um, I love DC. I've read loads and loads of Batman and Superman um, comics, graphic novels, all of that sort of stuff. Really familiar with a lot of the stuff, but I just really could not get on board with this as a movie, I'm afraid, other than it was a very average at best movie, which is such a shame considering the potential that it had. Anyway, that's my views on that. Love it or not, um, that's it. So uh, if you don't like it, well, I'm glad that... Also, if you don't like my views, you can discount them if you uh, if you wish. That's fine. Anyway, let's go on to listener questions. John, what's happening to us? All right, so listener questions, and we've only got um, a few here now. So first question up is Mark's, and Mark is asking... What is the most appealing or and off-putting qualities of Nintendo? Does Nintendo feature much in your gaming time? I have to admit, in terms of what's the most off-putting qualities of Nintendo, is I'm going to liken Nintendo to the video game version of Michael Jackson. In the Michael Jackson, whenever he re- did an album, he released the same every song on that album and several different versions of it before he moved on to the next one um you know in his later years he was much more productive earlier on but the he's it's i, I just I, I get really sick of oh it's a new mario oh it's a, new, a bit more innovation really because they've got really great innovative kit the switch is a fantastic little console but I just can't find the games on it and want to play on it. Um, and that's the truth of it. You know, that it's just, the, the console isn't really aimed at, um, the 40 or 50 year old generation for the most part. Um, I don't think there is some good games on there, but I'm not really a mobile gamer as well. And I think that that's another big issue for me. I only ever play my Switch is permanently plugged in to the mains into the tv i don't use it as a mobile stuff even if i'm sat with the wife and she's watching one of her tv things i'll be more likely checking out facebook or something like that so in terms of it featuring in my gaming time it doesn't really feature that much although i do play on it occasionally but not very often um i probably haven't played any more than two hours on it in this year uh, since uh, the 1st of uh, January, I would say. Um, so, second question is, are Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo drifting apart in terms of their approaches to gamers and how uh, do we want to access and play games? I certainly think that um, Microsoft and Sony have been at very different ends of the spectrum with Sony wanting to sell hardware and exclusive titles and Microsoft trying to be an all encompassing um gaming version of Netflix uh in some respects with the Game Pass sort of offering. N- uh, Switch uh Nintendo I think are very aware of what's going on in the world around them. Um but Nintendo are also quite happily sat in their own little bubble and are not really bothered about what the two big boys are doing. Uh, it's a bit like having, to use a school analogy, two guy, two, two guys in the, in the schoolyard, both trying to be the biggest of fighting amongst each other and a nerd in the background just quietly getting on doing what they do, uh, in the background and not paying any attention to the others. Um, 
that's the way I would sort of like do it as an analogy because I really don't think that Nintendo feel threatened by either Microsoft or Sony. I think that they might feel more threatened by Sony if the alleged rumours of the PlayStation Portable 2 are to be believed. And I really do hope that they are because I do think that Nintendo need a bit of a shake up um, in terms of that, um, you know, and a little bit more competitiveness uh, in their market. But uh, yeah, well, well, we'll have to we'll just wait and see. But they are completely apart. Although the recent announcement about the Bethesda games is tending to make it look like Microsoft are finally taking notice that gamers are saying we want exclusives on the platforms. Um, although, strangely enough, I've been looking at a couple of different Facebook groups and people saying on those groups just got hold of an Xbox for Game Pass, normally being a PlayStation player. The, their strategy is working, clearly. Um, so, interesting. And the last question for today is from uh, our good old friend Nick Wilson. Why can't directors just pick one aspect ratio and stick with it? Nick, you're a man after my own heart here. Just watch a Snyder Cut and it's 4x3. Didn't we bin the square, the old square TVs in the 90s? Shouldn't all movies and TV shows be full screen as standard 20 years ago? Um, I think what we should have is cinema aspect ratio on home TVs. So that would be 1.85 to 1. Um, for the most part, rather than 16 by 9, it's a slight difference. But I personally, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm watching a movie, I don't have a problem with having the black bars at the top and the bottom. Don't have a problem with that at all. What I don't like is to see the bars on the left and the right hand side, which is exactly what you got with the Snyder Cut. And that was Arguably the worst mistake that Zack Snyder made on that movie. But yeah, I'm totally with you, um, Nick. We should just have one standardised sort of um, aspect ratio in terms of movies, just so that you know that you're not missing out on anything. See, this is why I've never had a problem with letterbox movies that have gone um, horizontally. Because, you know, the old, like, Star Wars movies, when there were the old pan and scan 4x3 versions, I knew I was missing out on stuff in the periphery, whereas you get to see that. But I just, I don't like the 4x3 aspect ratio anymore in terms of watching movies or anything like that. So I really wish that we could um, drop it. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why um, I don't really watch very much of my old uh, Star Trek collection Um have to admit and uh, don't watch it anywhere near as much as I used to and that's because it's on 4x3 and watching it on a 16x9 screen it just feels so wrong and I really don't want to stretch it and make everybody look like they've been eating tons of lard so you know it's just one of them things anyway that's it for the show this week thanks for the questions guys um keep them coming in um other than that contact details you can uh Follow me uh, on Twitter at HERJUK. I'm on PSN, Xbox Live, Steam and other platforms as HERJUK as well. Also, if you want to friend me on uh, Epic Games, then it's Pop Culture Gamers. Otherwise, you can uh, follow the show. Uh, we have, um, obviously, our Twitter uh, feed, which is Pop Culture Gamer. For some unknown reason, we couldn't get Pop Culture Gamers because it was too longer uh, string of characters for a name um, other than that we have a facebook group not only do we have a facebook group we have a facebook page you can visit both of those we also have our website anchor.fm forward slash pop culture gamers uh, as well so there's lots of information or rather all of the shows are available on there don't forget you can listen to us on uh, um, apple podcasts you can get us on uh, breaker Castbox. Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Republic Radio, Spotify, and other platforms as well. We also have a Patreon if you want to uh, help out the show and contribute towards the uh, costs of the show. Always happy to uh, receive a donation. It does help for all of the stuff that we uh, need to do. Other than that, 
that's it. Short show, I'm afraid, but there's only me, and it's difficult to have a two-way conversation with only me. But I uh, hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. No doubt some controversial views on uh, the Snyder Cut, um, so uh, we'll be interested to see what you guys think. But other than that, it's a good night from me, and it will be a good night from Steve. Bye. Bye.